I expect you've heard the expression often enough as a child, if not recently, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Well now, what do you make of this? I'll read a bit of the Gospel from the second chapter of St John. We had it at Mass this morning, the, th the third Sunday of Lent. Just listen. Just before the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and pigeons, and money changers sitting at their counters there. So making a whip out of some cord, he drove them all out of the temple. Cattle and sheep as well, scattered the money changers' coins, knocked their tables over and said to the pigeon sellers, Take all this out of here and stop turning my father's house into a market. Then his disciples remembered the words of scripture, Zeal for your house will devour me. But the Jews intervened and said, What sign can you show us to justify what you have done? And Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And the Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and are you going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple that was his body. And when Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words he had said. So what do you make of that? The, if you just fasten on some detail, worrying about the money changers or the, the pigeons and all that, you might miss the point. That, that so often happens, if you just take on one bit, but it takes your fancy. I remember a primary school teacher telling me once, she told the story of the prodigal son to a small group of children, and when she got right to the end and the elder son wouldn't come into his father's party, she said, now, one of these people in the, in the story was sad. Who was it? And somebody said, the fattened calf that had been killed for the feast. Well, you can get caught up with that and you can argue about it if you're vegetarian and so on. But it's not getting the point of the story. And I tell you, the way to get the real meaning of a scripture story is to why did they tell it? Why did he record this? And St John, who wrote that gospel, tells us quite clearly. Listen, he said, Jesus gave many signs which have not been recorded. But I have recorded these so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's what he said. So he, he takes certain episodes, but the point is to increase and help our faith. That's why he takes them. And the pattern John always does in his Gospel he takes when Jesus talks about something quite ordinary and physical, the weather, a plant, water, bread, things like that, and then develops them into a much deeper meaning because he's trying to convey to us sometimes the nature of God, the mercy of God, something outside our experience. So he takes something ordinary. Another thing John does, he always does it in a sort of conversation. So the other people really get the wrong end of the stick. And quite honestly, the way it's expressed in the Gospel, you can't really blame them. But it's so that Jesus can be seen to produce this much deeper meaning. That water, he, he said, the, the Holy Spirit is like living water, not, not stagnant water, flowing pure, clear water, like something come gushing up from within you. And the woman said, but if you haven't got a bucket, not much point, is there? 
So she's talking about the physical thing, and Jesus is taking us into another realm. But see, like you need food, fair enough. The food that I will give you is my self. You need me like you need food. The bread I will give you means you will never hungry again, never be hungry again. So people said, well, that's good. Well, you have to pay the baker. They say a penny or two, won't it? In other words, they're on that physical level. But Jesus is, and it's just to show how Jesus, Jesus can develop into something more spiritual. For us teaching, not really arguing with them. And so in, in this gospel that we've just read, you can't blame, if you just take it as a physical story, you can't blame them for not knowing that he's talking about the temple of his body when they're all talking about the, the physical temple. The, 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 see, the temple in Jerusalem was a, uh, one of the wonders of the world. It's a fantastic building. The, the Romans destroyed it, but what we've seen left of it, we just don't know how they built that without modern machinery. It's quite extraordinary. So they're talking about this wonderful thing. But God wasn't in it. They got all the rules and regulations worked out. You had to have things to sacrifice, a lamb or a sheep or something. Or if you can't afford a lamb, two pigeons are the equivalent. You'd get it all worked out. But why? God was there. Jesus was there, totally ignored. Not just because it was Jesus, but the whole running of the temple had forgotten the reason why they were doing it. It was all worked out in a practical thing. And I'm afraid that is the danger with every religion. You want something you can measure and judge. Because that's the way most of our life operates. A business mind. If you, if you have a shop, a small shop, is it making a profit and are you selling stuff? You could say, well, it's lovely, everybody's welcome here and the staff get on so nicely together, but we don't actually sell anything. That's not much of a shop. Or say, a, a school, all oh, their uniform is beautiful, the kids look so lovely. They never learn anything and they hate the place, well, it's a bad school. But you have to have a measuring line, and we'd like to do that. How do you measure success? And that's what we do in business. And I'm afraid that's what creeps into religion. So some of the Pharisees would say, I fast all the year, twice a week, but you don't do that. But he's so proud of his fasting, he's forgetting why he's doing it. I do this and that and that, I've got it all. You say, what am I doing for Lent? I tick that off, what am I doing? Have I said my prayers? Yes, you tick it off. But the main thing is, am I growing in love? Am I coming closer to God? There are ten commandments in the Old Testament. They're really basic commandments. How we should behave with each other and our worship of God. But Jesus says, but really, they're not going to be worth it unless you have the main two commandments. Love God and love your neighbour. It doesn't talk about very much about loving God. It's mean if you love your neighbour, then you will love God. But am I growing in love? It's very difficult to measure. And so you can't. But I'm afraid our mentality is trying to measure it all the time. A friend of mine who works in a missionary country, he's a priest, he said he's always been trying to get the lay people to take over and do things. And he thought it being quite successful. And so really good businessmen, Catholic businessmen, have taken over. But they've tried to work out, is it efficient and is it producing a profit? Not is it bringing people together. Not if are people becoming more generous. If I try to measure, a, a, how do you judge a good parish? If people come to church... Tells you a certain amount. But if they come to church without love of each other, they don't really want to come together. They don't want to talk to the other people. Or somebody's begging at the church door and they get annoyed with him because I'm going to pray. Well, no, it's developing in the wrong way. It's impossible to apply our business mentality to our heart.
to our religion, to our love of God. And that is what matters. You come to church and pray and there's some kid crying his heart out. You can hardly hear what they're saying. And if you get irritated with that, instead of thinking, well, that mother really must have gone to a lot of effort to bring those children to church. What's she gone? Are we thinking of ourselves? Am, is my heart growing? I used to say, a really efficient man can't be a good parish priest. It wasn't just covering up because of the way I do things. Because you've really just got to be available to people. Actually, one man I badly judge, he was efficient, there's no doubt about it. And he was parish priest of a very big parish, enormous church, and they were having confirmation. The archbishop was coming to confirm the youngsters. He'd got everything arranged. He, he was really well organised. And half an hour before it was due to start, he sat there waiting for the doorbell for the archbishop to arrive. The doorbell went, he opened the door. It wasn't the archbishop. It was someone came to tell him that one of his parishioners had just been arrested for sexual abuse of his daughter. That priest left all the people being confirmed and the Archbishop to get on with it on their own and he went down to see that family who were in distress. That's a priest. But it upsets all your organisation, I'm afraid. And a bit like that with Pope Francis, when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he was such a busy man, it's very difficult to get hold of him. Obviously he had to go off to Rome for various meetings. He was often in converse with the government because he, he represented the church and, the, and the, all that. And a priest was saying, I really want to get hold of the cardinal, but he's so busy, I can understand that. And then discovered he spent half an hour chatting to some homeless woman in the street. Or if he, if he would take a taxi instead of the bus or come by car, we'd get the meeting going on time. And it would be really efficient, and he leaves contact with the people. He'd come out, oh, forget the people. And the church dries up. We can't judge if we're growing in love. I can't offer you a remedy. All I can say is go to the Lord and beg him to give you a generous heart. So don't get caught up with judging details of how, if that is working or if it's sufficient or not. Don't find you criticising the way people do things. But more just trying to love and grow in love. I don't say try. Ask God to give you a really generous heart. Pray for that, that you become deep in yourself, more like Christ. And if you ask for it, he'll give you that blessing. To grow in the love of Christ, to grow in the love of other people, is a thing you can never judge. So don't be caught up by judging the way we tick off things that we're doing right in our own religion. I give you a blessing that they may come to you. God, our Father, Give these people who listen now and are praying generous hearts to love you and to love one another and one day come to realise how you have worked through them. You are Christ our Lord. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit come down on you and on those who are dear to you, both living and departed, and remain with you forever.